chapter 6. If you have a Bible today, a guy spots a sign outside a house that reads, Talking Dog for Sale. Intrigued, he walks in. So what have you done with your life? He asked the dog. He says, I've led a very full life. I, I, I lived in the Alps rescuing avalanche victims. Then I served my country in Iraq. And now I'm, I spend my days reading to the residents of a retirement home. This guy is flabbergasted. He asked the dog's owner, why on earth would you want to get rid of an incredible dog like that? The owner said, because he's a liar. He hasn't done any of that stuff. Hmm. <laughs> Holy Spirit, we just invite you to come. And we position ourselves to hear your word, to hear the things that you want to say to us. Lord, it might be different things to different people, but Lord, we, we as it were, put up our spiritual antennas and tune in to hear what you would say to us. We desire to hear so that we can be doers, Lord. And Father, we know that you empower us by your Spirit. And so, Holy Spirit, have your way in Jesus' name. Amen. I, I want to share a message with you today that I probably won't be able to finish. And, and we'll finish it next week. Uh, how many know what goes on in our thought life is pretty important? What influences our thinking has quite a mastery over us. Proverbs says, as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. Sometimes our, our thought patterns are, are a result of maybe some difficult seasons, difficult times that we've walked through. And, and it's like that season is still impacting us in our thinking, even though the season is over. I've known people with a, a, a poverty mindset. It, 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 and if, see, if you have that kind of a mindset, you can't seem to see anything but lack. And, and living in lack, all of your imaginations go along those lines. I, I've, I've known people with a, a sickness, an infirmity mindset. They can't seem to see themselves except struggling with, with, with sickness after sickness. I'm sure the woman with the issue of blood had an infirmity mindset. Imagine spending all that you had going to doctor after doctor after doctor and not getting better, but actually getting worse with, with all of her resources spent. I'm sure that's all, she, that's all, that's the only place she could see herself. But then, then she heard about Jesus, and she heard some of the stories about how people were getting healed, and she hears that he's in town, and so she gets so excited, and she does something she's not even supposed to do, that is go out in public because of her bleeding infirmity, she was unclean. And anybody that she touched, anybody that touched her would be considered unclean, but she didn't care. She said, if only I can touch the hem of his garment, I will be made whole. All of a sudden, her imagination began to break out of that infirmity and sickness mindset, and she started seeing herself get healed when Jesus touched her. And by the time she made it to him, Have you ever tried to sneak something away from God and get away with it and run away? She just assumed she could touch the hem of his garment, get healed, and then sneak back out of there. I once challenged a pastor. The pastor told me, he said, seek the healer, not healing. 
And, and actually, that's probably a message that I, I've even preached before. But this, this gal wasn't seeking the healer. She was seeking healing. And she thought she'd get it and get out of there. Although it didn't turn out that way. We're talking about mindsets. I've known people with a, a failure mindset. It's like they can't even handle success. If they, if they get a job and things start going well, they will consciously or unconsciously sabotage that job because they are heading into unfamiliar territory called success. Jesus talked about three things that influence our thinking. Three things that influence our thought patterns. Three sources, three different sources of influence on our minds. He summarized them as the leaven of Herod, the leaven of the Pharisees, and the leaven of the kingdom. Three things Three perspectives that can play into how we think and how we process things in our mind. And I, I want to talk about learning to distinguish those influences in order to cultivate a kingdom mindset or, or cultivate kingdom thinking. Jesus was a kingdom thinker. Kingdom thinking is not limited to this natural realm. It sees beyond what the natural eye can see. Now, it may sound like I'm describing faith because faith is the evidence of things not seen. Faith sees beyond what the natural eye can see. How do we cultivate faith thinking or kingdom thinking? Now, Jesus used this analogy of leaven. How many here have ever made bread from scratch? Yeah. So, so any of you that have done that, you know the significance of leaven. You put a little leaven in the mix and it begins to permeate every part of it. Because that's what leaven does. If you let a little bit of bad leaven into your thinking, it begins to permeate all of your thoughts, thus affecting all of your thought processes that's why this is so important. Now, I want to reference a story that's found in Mark chapter 6. Everybody doing okay? I don't know what I'd do if anybody ever answered me. I thank, thank you for recognizing that's a rhetorical question. All that's needed is a nod or a... Um, the, the story is found in Mark 6, verse 34 through 44. I'm not going to read it but I want to give you the address so you can go back and read it. But in this story, Jesus is moved with compassion for, for a multitude of people. And he said, because they are like sheep without a shepherd. They were ready to follow, but nobody was leading them. So he began to teach them many things. But when nighttime came, his disciples came to him, and they said to him, now th this is Jesus' Jesus's disciples trying to counsel him. They said, this is a deserted place, and the hour is late. Send the people away to go get some food to eat. There are no stores. There's no restaurants around here. You need to send them away to get some food. <coughs> Excuse me. Now, that kind of thinking was influenced by one of the leavens. But it wasn't the leaven of the kingdom. And so not following their counsel, he said to them, you give them something to eat. Their response, where are, where are we possibly going to get enough food to do that? And it, and it will cost a lot, and they throw out this figure, 200 denarii, which is about the wages for one man for eight months in that day. So Jesus, still not listening to their counsel, refusing to be influenced by that kind of leaven, he said to them, how many loaves do you have? And they looked around and checked everything, and they said, well, we've got five loaves and two fish. 
Jesus instructed everybody to sit down in groups of hundreds and fifties. He took the five loaves and the two fish. He looked up to heaven. He blessed it, and he broke it, giving it to the disciples, and then he sent them out to distribute it. (laughs) And everyone ate and was filled. Then they took up 12 baskets full of leftovers. Those who had eaten were about 5,000 men. So let's just summarize. Jesus fed 5,000 men plus women and children, which would greatly up that number, with five loaves of bread and two fish, and there were 12 baskets left over. There was more food left than when they started. Just think about that for a minute. Now, the next story I want to talk about is found a couple chapters later in Mark chapter 8, and I'm just going to summarize this quickly. It's found in in chapter 8, it's verses 1 through 10. In this story, Jesus feeds 4,000 people with seven loaves of bread and a few fish, and there were seven large baskets of food left over. So, So stay in Mark 8. We begin by saying there are three things that can influence our thinking. Three leavens. Two bad influences or leavens and, and the, the good influence of the kingdom. There, are the, there is the, Herod, uh, the leaven of Herod, the leaven of the Pharisees, and the leaven of the kingdom. Now, in your notes, uh, I, this could have been the title of my message today, Learning to Live with a Kingdom Mentality. Everybody doing okay? So we're still in in Mark chapter 8. This is right after the last miracle that we just talked about. Jesus has fed 4,000 people with seven loaves of bread and a a few fish. Afterwards, seven large baskets left over. Verse 13. And he left them, and getting into the boat again, departed to the other side. Now the disciples had forgotten to take bread. Bread. And they did not have more than one loaf with them in the boat. Then he charged them, saying, Take heed, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the leaven of the kingdom. I'm sorry, the the leaven of the Pharisees and the leaven of Herod. And they reasoned among themselves, saying, It's because we brought no bread. (laughs) But Jesus, being aware of it, He asked them seven questions. Seven. The first question he said was, this is in verse 17, why do you reason because you have no bread? Second question, do you not yet perceive or understand? Is your heart still hardened? Having eyes... Do you not see? And having ears, do you not hear? And do you not remember? When I broke the five loaves for the 5,000, how many baskets full of fragments did you take up? They said to him, 12. Also, when I broke the seven for the 4,000, how many large baskets of fragments did you take up? And they said, seven. He said to them, So he said 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 to them, how is it, last question, how is it that you don't understand? Now the truth is, Jesus really wasn't talking about bread at all. When he said, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the leaven of Herod, he was talking about two negative influences in our thinking processes. That, that, that are like leaven that can permeate our thinking. Two influences that can affect our thinking in a negative way. Now the other leaven that he talks about is the leaven of the kingdom. So stay in Mark chapter 8, but I want to bounce to Matthew 13, 33 real quick. Another parable he spoke to them. The kingdom of heaven is like leaven, which a woman took and hid in three measures of meal till it was all leavened. Now, as we said, 
the thing about leaven is it permeates what you put it in. It permeates every part of it. How many here want to have their, 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 their minds permeated with the leaven of heaven or the leaven of the kingdom? Okay, those five that raised your hand, you stay. The rest of you are released. <laughs> I have a slide for this, but Jesus taught his disciples about three different influences common to men. The leaven of Herod, the leaven of the Pharisees, and the leaven of the kingdom. All of our thought processes and decisions, and thus our choices, come out of one of these influences. They are three influences that affect how we think, how we process. They actually give us our worldview. They affect us every moment of every single day. Now, I'm going to rename them for more clarity, and I'll explain why as we keep going. But this is in your notes. The leaven of Herod is an atheistic influence. The leaven of the Pharisees is a religious influence. And the leaven of the kingdom is a kingdom influence. Now, before we dig into this, I need to address something that has to do with the kingdom. The real key to releasing the kingdom around us, it's really quite simple. The real key to releasing the kingdom around you is being under the authority of the king. The authority of the kingdom is delegated to us as we are under the authority of the king. Now, why would I mention that? Why would I even say that? Because many people want the results of the kingdom, the, the fruit, the, the benefits of the kingdom, without stepping under the authority of the king. I, I, I want the blessings of the kingdom. I just don't want to relinquish control of my life to the king. And it's kind of like saying, hey, let's live together. Let, let's shack up. I want the benefits of marriage, but I don't want the commitment or the responsibility. I, I want the benefits of the kingdom, but not, not the responsibility. Now, see, unfortunately, this unbiblical kind of thinking of going for the benefits without the commitment has permeated a lot of the church. It, it's created kind of a consumerism mentality. And many Christians have this kind of self-serving mentality. They want the benefits of, a, say, say, a local church, but they don't want the commitment. And, and it becomes all about, what can I get out of it? What do I get? I want the blessings of a local church body, but I don't want to commit myself to anything. I don't want to apply my hand to any area of ministry. I, I, I want the blessings but not the commitment or responsibility. And it's kind of like shacking up with somebody. Now, it's, it's an unbiblical perspective and lifestyle because everyone in God has abilities and giftings that are to be used for the common good. And see, what makes a, a, a church a body is every joint supplying, and thus the body is edifying itself in love through the practical outworking of what all of us bring to the table. There are differing roles, differing anointings, giftings, but see, everyone is significant and important. But see, if we have this mindset, what do I get out of it? Then it becomes something quite different than what God intended. Many people want the benefits of the kingdom without stepping under the authority of the king. It's an issue of dominion. Everything we face in life is an issue of dominion. Who has dominion of your life? Who are you surrendering to? Who are you agreeing with? Satan is empowered by human agreement, but so is God. 
Man was, has been delegated the authority on this planet. Genesis 1, 26 through 28. He created us in his image, according to his likeness, and then he has a purpose where he gives us authority where we are representing him in the earth that we're under his authority. But see, when we come into agreement with the enemy, we are empowering what he is saying. Do you know that the enemy has very, very, very little power apart from our agreement. We are the ones that, that empower him when we come into agreement with him. How do we agree with him? When we embrace his lies. When we believe his lies. When we, when we buy into the lies of the enemy. You know, a person can have been completely delivered from a particular habit or, or sin, and that person can see that habit resurrected simply by receiving the accusations and the shame and the guilt that the enemy throws at them. S Satan comes to remind you of the things that are under the blood, and if you agree with him, if you pull them out from under the blood, you will see the old lifestyle empowered. Who or what are, are we agreeing with? It's vital to understand what comes from hell and what comes from heaven. Because there is a war going on for our agreement. God is looking for your agreement. How can two walk together unless they be agreed? God is looking for your agreement. I love this verse of scripture in 1 Corinthians 1 verse 20. It says, for all the promises of God in him are yes, and in him amen to the glory of God through us. Whew. Since you are in Christ, since you are in him, how many here are in Christ? Since you are in him, all the promises of God, the Father says yes. But he is waiting for the amen to come from us. Heaven says yes, but is waiting for earth's amen. He is waiting for you to say, so be it in my life. He is waiting for your agreement. Because of Jesus, heaven is saying yes. Heaven is only waiting for someone on earth to say amen, to someone on earth to agree with him. Miracles happen through the agreement of the believer. When you say amen, which means so be it, you are coming into agreement with heaven. And see, we are empowering heaven to be released into the earth by the delegated authority that's given to us as we are under the authority of the king. You are not here by some kind of chance, wandering through life. We are here on divine assignment. Our assignment is to agree with heaven to release the kingdom of God into the earth. So let's look back at our story that we just read in, in the Matthew, I'm sorry, Mark chapter 8. They had just fed 4,000 people with seven loaves of bread and had seven large baskets left over. They get into the boat, Jesus and his disciples, and in verse 15, he says, beware, Jesus says, beware of the leaven of Herod and the Pharisees. Leaven is outside influence on thought patterns. Leaven affects the direction that thought patterns go. It actually affects the starting point of a thought pattern which greatly affects the conclusion that you will come to. Just like leaven in the natural has this amazing influence on bread in the same way the leaven Jesus is talking about greatly affects and permeates the way we think, which will in turn permeate the way we live as a man thinks. 
Strongholds exist in the thought patterns of both believers and unbelievers. Would you say that's true? We are in a process of those strongholds coming down. We are in a process of being transformed by the renewing of our minds. That, that renewing is the embracing of a kingdom mindset where the leaven of the kingdom is permeating our thought patterns. Now, I want to read two verses that we're all very familiar with. 2 Corinthians 10, verses 4 and 5. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. They're not after the flesh. They're not slingshots or even semi-automatic shotguns or bazookas. They, they are spiritual. But mighty in God for, the pulling, for pulling down strongholds. What are strongholds? Casting down arguments and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. Bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. We have spiritual weaponry that is powerful to pull down strongholds, to pull down arguments that are contrary to God, anything that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, anything that is contrary to the truth of God's word. But see, when we are under the influence of these two leavens Jesus cautioned his disciples about, the leaven of Herod and the leaven of the Pharisees, <laughs> It, that's stinking thinking or, or the decay of the mind. And it actually attracts the demonic world. They come to make supernatural what started as natural, to make supernatural what started as a, as a natural thought pattern or a natural sin. Just as flies in the natural are attracted to decay, so Beelzebub, the lord of the flies, is attracted to decay in the human mind. The New Testament warns about jealousy and selfish ambition. Why? Because they attract disorder and every evil thing. Jealousy and ambition are not kingdom thoughts. James said it this way in James 3.16. For where, where envy and self-seeking exist, confusion, and every evil thing are there. Whoa. The context here is demonic chaos. Confusion of every kind. James is talking to believers. Why? Because certain ways of thinking send up uh, like a signal in the spiritual realm that attracts the demonic. Now, it's also true that certain thought patterns, kingdom patterns, attract God and attract the host of heaven, angelic activity. So Jesus came with this profound message. He said, repent, change the way you think, for the kingdom is at hand. It's at hand, it's within reach. You can live your entire lifetime and not realize that there is a superior reality within reach. God never intended for us to live solely out of the natural realm, but rather to be constantly invaded by the spiritual realm. Repent. Change the way you think. Why? Why would Jesus say that? Because we have to change the way we think about the kingdom. It's not something way off somewhere else. Jesus brought the kingdom with him when he came to earth. He demonstrated the power of the kingdom wherever he went. And that's why he never lived under the limitations of the natural realm. And so you don't have to either. Repent. Change the way you think for the kingdom is at hand. It is within reach, but to embrace that, you have to change the way you think about these things. The answer to every quest, to every desire and passion of your heart 
is found in the kingdom of God. Seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. And everything you need will be added to you. You will not miss out on anything. Every need is met in the present reality of the manifested kingdom. The word kingdom comes from two words. King's domain. Or king's dominion. The kingdom of God is the king's domain. It is wherever Jesus Christ is exalted as Lord. Jesus is the king of God's kingdom. The kingdom of God is the realm or sphere where Jesus is exalted as Lord. When you release the kingdom, you are releasing his will. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth. Just like it's already being done in heaven. Now, I, I want to read a paraphrased version of this story. I'm going to keep going back to this because there's some things we need to see and understand. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> My dad would say I, I swallowed down the wrong throat. <coughs> <coughs> So this is kind of a, a paraphrased version of this story with the disciples. Jesus said, Beware of the leaven of Herod, <coughs> excuse me, and the leaven of the Pharisees. The disciples say, Oh no, I forgot to bring bread. John, did you bring some bread? Nobody brought bread. What are we going to do? Jesus, first of all, I wasn't talking about bread. But let's pretend for a moment that I was talking about bread. So he brings it down to their level. Jesus says, okay, uh, you know, we had a problem with a lack of bread a while back. Do you remember that? 5,000 men showed up. There was not enough food. How many loaves did we have? Now, whenever God asks a question, it's never because he doesn't know. Whenever God asks a question, it's because he wants to get us thinking. Jesus asked his disciples seven questions. They, they were meant, designed to, to cause strate a, a strategic thought pattern that would come to an understanding or come to a place of revelation. How many loaves did we have, the disciples? Five. How many baskets were left over when we were through? The disciples, 12. Jesus said, now let's see. We just recently fed 4,000, didn't we? Disciples, yes. Jesus, how many loaves did we start with? The disciples, seven. Jesus said, how many baskets full did we have when we were done? Disciples, seven. Jesus says, so, when we started with less and we fed more people, we had more left over. Now, what are you worried about again? How important are your resources? Now, this is important for us to understand because Jesus did not talk to his disciples this way until after he had fed the multitudes twice. Why? Because they would have not had a, a reference point before that. They did not know by experience what God could do. God led them into the experience, but expecting them to learn something from it. When God does a miracle for you, you, you get to see it, you get to experience it, to be part of it. What is he doing? He is teaching you how to see into the invisible realm. A miracle is a tutor a gift from God to show us what exists on the other side of what we can see, beyond the, what the natural eye can perceive. When I experience a miracle, and then I face that, that same kind of problem again, and I go back into the same doubt and unbelief, it's because I've not allowed the testimony of the Lord to have its proper effect on me. That is changing the way I think and receive. I have not allowed the in, it to influence my thinking yet. 
My, my thought processes are still influenced by different leaven. Is this making sense at all? The first time they had this bread problem, Jesus said, have them sit down in, in, in groups of 50 and 100. Bring me, bring me the food. He prays over it, then he divides the baskets up to the disciples, and he says, now go distribute it. And as they started giving it out, the baskets didn't deplete. Now see, this was the first time they had experienced anything like this. I, the reason I think there were 12 baskets left over is because the, the disciples just went crazy. Like, like, here, ask some more. No, no, you need some more. This is amazing. So he's running around, they're running around, and all of a sudden, everybody's filled, and there's 12 baskets left over. It was fun. It was an amazing experience. They had experienced that twice. Jesus does not rebuke them, but he carefully talks to them, and, and asking them several questions designed to get them thinking. Why do you reason that you have no bread. See, that kind of reasoning comes from atheistic thinking. Atheistic leaven. In your notes, why does your reasoning start with what you lack? He has displayed to them that there are unlimited resources in the kingdom. Why are you thinking about what you don't have? Why, why is your thought process, process beginning with your lack? Now, in your notes, thought processes and patterns that start with our lack can only end up with human resources meeting human needs. Kingdom thinking is different. Kingdom thinking lives with an awareness that anything is possible at any time. Because the great invader is prepared and ready to invade should there be someone, <coughs> excuse me, should there be someone who would agree with him and give him the invitation. Faith is a result of surrender to the thought patterns of God or of the kingdom when we receive his thoughts into our sanctified imagination and say, amen, faith is born. It's natural. It's easy. It's not a result of striving. Why do you reason that you have no bread? How did you get there after the experiences that you have had with me? See, our, our history with God <coughs> I'm sorry. Sets a standard. It, 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 it's like our own requirement is raised because God expects me to learn from this miracle. How many people here have ever experienced a financial miracle? Now, look at all those hands. Isn't that amazing? I remember as a young Christian being in want. I remember, you know, you, you make the choice of, well, I'm going to pay that bill and I'm going to put gas in the car, but I don't know how we're going to eat, or, you know, or something like that. And, and when God supplies that need, especially, you know, like as a family, we would just pray, you know, and say, God, this is what we need. Nobody else knows, you know, it's just like, just the family, and all of a sudden, somebody would show up with money or groceries or something like that, and you just think, whoa, I am not limited to the natural realm anymore. I, I, that those miracles are designed to show us that God is real, his kingdom is real, and it's a kingdom of abundance, and you can trust God. Why do you reason that you have no bread? When I first started seeing miracles of healing, it was not because of my great faith. It felt like God jumped over my unbelief and, and did miracles many times. But because I, I stepped out and positioned myself for a miracle, 
I, I stepped out in faith and prayed for somebody, even when my faith may have been struggling. But see, in, in, in doing so, and, and seeing God show up, and seeing miracles happen, in doing so, God has been teaching me or training me to believe him and to see beyond what I can normally see. My, my eyes are being trained to see beyond this realm. Certain things, certain infirmities, when I see them, because I've seen them healed so many times, I just know God is going to do a miracle. It, it's, it's just about ready to happen, period. It's going to happen. And, and, and I'm sure that that's true with you too, that, that you've seen answers to prayer in particular areas so often that you just, it, it gives you a confidence to, to move into that arena and pray for somebody else. The kingdom is at hand. It is within reach, if you can see it. But I must repent to embrace it. I must change my thinking. I, I want every stronghold every wrong thought pattern to come down in Jesus' name. I want every atheistic influence or religious influence that is affecting my thinking, I want it to be exposed, and I want it to come down in Jesus' name. Do you not yet perceive or understand? Is your heart still hardened? In your notes, the inability to see is linked to hardness of heart. Now, there's a progression in these questions. Having eyes, do you not see? Having ears, do you not hear? Do you not remember? First, he says, do you not see? Why were they expected to see? Because of their history. Their, their history in the miraculous. They had been invited into a revelation of the nature of God through the miracles that they had seen. There is a revelation of, of the goodness of God that comes through the miraculous. You know, without the power of God, we have robbed the world of, the, of a revelation of God in His nature. The display of his power, the revelation of his nature, it, it comes with an invitation to, to deeper relationship. I didn't say that right. Let me try to rephrase that. When I experience a miracle, when I see God do something supernatural, it's really an invitation to know the God of miracles in a greater way. There is an invitation to a greater encounter with God, which is actually more significant than the miracle itself. It's an invitation to the person who experienced the miracle. It's an invitation to the person that prayed or, or believed God for it to happen. It's an invitation to a greater revelation of God. Don't read your Bible to be smarter about God. Read your Bible to encounter God himself. That's what it's meant to do. Jesus said to the people one time in John 5, 39, he said, you search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life, and these are they which testify of me. You're getting all this stuff out of my book, but it doesn't take you into an encounter with me, so all it's doing is making you more religious. This book is not about getting smarter. This book is designed to bring us into an encounter with the author of it. Having eyes, do you not see? Oh, okay, you, you can't see. Okay, let's lower it. Uh, having ears, do you not hear? Can you at least hear the promises I've told you, the teachings I've shared that you have heard? You can't do that either. Can you at least remember? Do you, do you not remember? Then he takes them to the stories about the loaves and the fish. I used to tell people when I run out of water, I stop preaching but I've been known to send people to fetch more. <laughs> Probably 
every single person in this room, including those of you that are watching online, you're facing a situation that you have been thoroughly equipped by God for. But because of anxiety over the problem, you've lost sight of the tools that God has given you for this moment in time. And see, if you'll take the time to quiet your heart and remember, just force yourself to be still. Remind yourself of the miracles you've seen. Remind yourself of the things that God has done in your life. Transform your sanctified imagination into a kingdom imagination so that you have a kingdom mentality to draw from. The kingdom is right here, right now. The power necessary for any situation. Begin seeing it in your sanctified imagination. Many years ago, I was part of a church, and I was one of the leaders of that church, and we had a bunch of people from Dayton that were coming to uh, coming to church on Sunday morning, and so we decided to have a a, a Bible study, a home group in Dayton, and so I was heading one night to the Bible study, and God is dealing with me. Have you ever... Like, like I knew what I was going to share on that night, and like God had a different idea. It's always best to go with him. But, but I felt like God was saying, I want to heal a bunch of people tonight. Now, healing was not foreign to me, but, but it, I'd never done it in a group. You know what I mean? Like I'd catch somebody before service or somebody after service or if they stayed home sick from church or whatever. But So I was going, I was praying for people, and I was seeing God do stuff, but I didn't quite know how to do it in a group. How do you do that? And, and what God was challenging me with was Romans ten seventeen. So then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And I felt like God was saying, whatever word you preach, people will have faith for it. If you preach the word of God concerning salvation, the saving Jesus will show up and, and people will, will encounter or experience salvation. If you preach the word of God concerning the baptism in the Holy Spirit, Jesus the baptizer will show up. And if you preach the word of God concerning healing, Jesus the healer would show up. So I, we had worship, and, 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 and I'm just, I still don't know quite how to do this, but I'm just taking them into these scriptures where Jesus is healing people, and all this stuff is happening, and, and, and it came time, you know, I'm just saying, how many here need healing? To my shock, three quarters of the people raise their hand. And I, I don't know what to do. And so I, I had another guy that, that played guitar. I said, so you keep leading the people in worship. I did that out of unbelief. Keep leading the people in worship. And then I walked over to one of the people that I saw raise their hand. And I said, what was your problem? They said such and such. I prayed for him, and God healed him. I was so excited. So I went to the next person, and, and, I, and I asked them their problem, and I prayed for them, and God healed them. And I felt like a, a spirit of faith or something happened to me, and I immediately stopped the guy that was leading everybody in worship, and I had these two people share their testimony. And to my knowledge, every single person that got prayed for that night got healed. It was just amazing. And, and I, I, in my youthful, I don't know what it was, you know, I'm driving home and I'm just thinking, man, my ministry is going to change now. You know, I didn't realize that a spirit of faith had come on me. Like the next morning, it wasn't there anymore. <laughs> like I was back to normal. And, uh, but here's what happened. There was a lady there that night that God opened her ear. And she had a daughter that was really, really deaf. She, she wore these huge hearing aids on her ears. And so she called the pastor, the senior pastor in the church, and she said, I'd like to bring my daughter to church so she could get healed on Sunday. Well, the other pastor was a little bit intimidated by that. And so he said, yeah. And so he calls me up. He says, okay, when we get to that part, that's you. 
like, like kind of at the end of the service, I'll let you do that. But so the the end, so so immediately I started imagining the situation. How could you not? But in my imagination, I keep kept imagining her not getting healed. And what was I going to say? I kept imagining these these scenarios, and 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 I. And I Sometimes I had better answers than other times, but, but finally I felt like God said, what are you doing? What are you doing? That, that's the wrong leavens that are impacting you. That's not the leaven of the kingdom. And so I started like kicking out all that stuff, and I started imagining this, this moment in the service. And the pastor turned it over to me, and, and I, I, I came down. I invited this young girl to come up. This is in my imagination. And, and I remember having her mom take off her hearing aids, and I would say, ears be opened in Jesus' name. And I stepped back, and I said, can you hear me? She says, I, in my imagination. And, I, and I'd say, back up about 10 feet. I said, can you hear me? She says, Yes. And so that is the only thing that I would let play in my mind. Period. Now, not, I'm not telling you that there wasn't a struggle, that there wasn't a battle there. Our minds often go so easily to the negative. So easily. It's almost like we're trained at worst case scenario. Anybody else go to that school? And so, well, my computer went off. Uh, so, so finally, the Sunday came, and he called me up, and, and I, I did it just like I saw it in my imagination. I invited her up, and her mom took off her hearing aids, and I prayed for her, and, and I said, can you hear me? She says, yes. She backs up about 10 feet. I said, can you hear me? She says, yes. She backs up about 10 more feet, and she says, can, I said, can you hear me? She says, yes. The whole congregation erupted in praise to God. I mean, it was just a, an amazing thing of, of glorifying God because the kingdom showed up. What was I doing? I was allowing the leaven of the kingdom to permeate my thoughts, sanctify your imagination to only be influenced by the kingdom. Jesus takes them back over the miracles they saw because those miracles are a testimony of God's goodness. Why is the testimony so important? It reminds us of who God is what his covenant is like, how he, who he intends to be in our lives. There, there is a reason that we make time for testimonies in this church because when you hear a genuine testimony of God showing up in encounter, it just stirs your faith in your heart. And you think, well, if God did it then, he could do it now. If God did it for them, he could do it for me because he's no respecter of persons. Revelations 19.10, the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. When someone shares of God's miraculous intervention, that's the goodness of God. That is the testimony of Jesus. Whether it's healing, supernatural provision, deliverance, protection, when someone shares of God's miraculous intervention, that, that, that prophesies to those who have ears to hear. It prophesies that another miracle is available. Why? Because God is no respecter of persons. And he is the same yesterday, today, and forever. If he did it for them, he will do it for you. The nation of Israel would fall into great backsliding when they forgot the testimony. They were instructed to keep the testimony. They were to steward the miraculous things that God had done for them. It was to be the inspiration in their conversation for who God was. If they could just realize who God had been, it would create an anticipation for who God could be right now. And see, that kind of anticipation draws God. 
and miracles increased. That kind of thinking attracts God in the angelic realm. But when the miracles fail to be discussed by you and me, I was, I was texting this week with, I, I don't know if you remember this miracle, but when I was at Saturday night at the church, God just gave me a really unusual word of knowledge. He said, there's, there's going to be somebody in your church that their, their, their tear ducts don't work, and for three years, they've had to squirt their eyes all, all day long. And, and, so, and so I'm thinking, okay, okay. Uh, so so that, that morning, I, I began to share that word of knowledge. And this gal had come to church that went to Walla Walla University, but she was part of a class that required her to visit other churches. And so one of those churches that she visited was Grace Church. And so when she heard that word of knowledge and she didn't see anybody else respond, she came forward. We probably have it on video. And, and I just prayed for her, commanded those tear ducts to open, and I just said to her, talk to me at the, end, at the end of service. I want to know what God's doing. Well, she talked to me at the end of service and she said, before I got to my seat after you prayed for me, I had tears welling up in my eyes. And she was so impacted by, by this miracle that, that she wrote her whole thesis for that class on the miracle that God did for her. But see, the testimony declares that God is alive. He is not the God of the past. He is, he is I am. How many know I am is present tense? <laughs> Shoo. When we stop talking about the miracles that God has done, what happens, it's not declared, it's not prophesied, expectation declines, and therefore the activity of God declines. This is where dispensational theology comes from. When people stop talking about the miracles, they stop believing God for miracles, and that the faith in People declines, and all around us there's this downward spiral because we lose touch with what God has covenanted with us to do in our time. It's the testimony. Jesus said, do you not remember? Do you not remember the loaves and the fish? If you're facing a crisis, I know that you could sit down, get quiet, prayerfully consider maybe the last six or 12 months. And I, I totally believe that the Holy Spirit would show you the tools that he has put in your hands for what you are presently facing. The enemy attempts to get you in anxiety so you can't see the tools. To blind your eyes to the unseen realm. See, anxiety brings us into fear. And fear is the opposite of faith. Fear is faith in the inferior. Fear blinds me to seeing what faith allows me to see. Fear blinds me to seeing what faith allows me to see. The leaven of Herod, the leaven of the Pharisees, the leaven of the kingdom. These are influences that create thought patterns. You know, heat is what activates leaven and causes the bread to expand. And see, heat is what activates the leaven in our lives too. In your notes, the furnace of affliction in our life activates whatever leaven we have been living under the influence of. It brings to the surface what influence we have been living under. It's, it's the difficulties, the trials, the heat of circumstances that causes that leaven to be activated. Now, the leaven of the kingdom works the same. It is activated in the fire. The kingdom is for such a time as this. Now, let's, let's just dig a little bit deeper into leaven for a moment, okay? You guys okay? I may finish this message, I don't know. But I, I won't, I promise I won't order pizza, pizza and keep you guys here, okay. Pizza. The leaven of Herod 
is an atheistic leaven. Now, it's going to surprise you when you hear me say this. One of the big problems in the church today is atheism. Now, I know that seems kind of strange to hear, one, uh, but not, not in our doctrinal statements, but, but let me illustrate what I mean. Atheism is this. Bob, who is an atheist, when he faces a financial problem, see, Herod's leaven kind of thinks like this. Like, if there is a God... God helps those who help themselves. Which really means, it's my responsibility. You're in a boat without any bread because you forgot to bring bread. Make a list next time and make sure you bring bread. In your, in your notes, you are basically your own answer to the problems and issues of life. So practical atheism is this. Bob here faces a problem he does not even think to bring God into the situation or to go to the counsel of God's word regarding it. He is carrying out his atheistic lifestyle. So if I, as a believer, face a problem and do not bring God into the situation, I am living the way the atheist lives. That's practical atheism. Herod's leaven... You're, you're a self-made individual. You have no bread in the boat because you didn't bring bread. Take responsibility for your problem. Make a better list. Next time, bring bread. Now, I have just described how a lot of Christians live and deal with their stuff. They live and act like the atheist that lives down the street. You guys Okay. The leaven of the Pharisees is a religious leaven. In your notes, they have God in form, but not in power. They have a form of godliness, but deny the power thereof. Their approach to the boat idea, deal is this. God in his sovereignty has arranged for you to be in this boat without any bread so that you could better identify with those who also have no bread in this hour. Or, or this, and, and you too, in the sovereignty of God, have no bread so that you could better understand how those who suffer, lack, and need, how they feel in times of great crisis. The, the leaven of the Pharisees, or Phariseeism, provides explanations, but not solutions. The religious leaven is about providing explanations. And see, there's a danger in the church today to find explanations for physical things, for conditions, explanations that do not bring the power of God for a solution. Boy, you know, I, I can sure see why that person has the problems that they do. Look at their lifestyle. Look at the choices that they're making. But see, if we go that route, we're powerless to bring a solution. That, that's Phariseeism. That's religious thinking. Repentance is needed in the church. Repentance is needed in my life. When, whenever I see that my thinking processes are different from God's. Whenever I, I recognize that I'm not bringing God into the situation or, or whenever I'm just trying to explain things rather than actually solve things, I need to repent. Worship team, please come. The last kingdom I want to talk about is, is the leaven of the kingdom. We are so almost done. I actually finished the message. I mean, I didn't think I'd have time. Romans 12, 2 says, and do not be conformed to this world. Don't let the world take you and shape you and tell you what's right, tell you what's wrong, tell you, don't, don't draw your value system from the world, but rather be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you can prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Did you know it takes a renewed mind to recognize the will of God? 
to truly discern the good and acceptable and perfect will of God, you can't even recognize it when you're under the influence of atheistic or religious thinking. Those leavens will cause you to settle for something else and maybe even think it's God's will. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind and you will know his will. The last note is miracles follow those who embrace a kingdom mindset. Miracles follow those who have a renewed mind. Could we just stand together? I, I, I would like, like, yeah, why don't you pray with me, okay? Heavenly Father, I didn't hear anybody praying. Oh, okay. Open my ears, Lord. <laughs> Having ears, do you? One more time. Heavenly Father, my Father, I am asking you to father me, to be the author of my thoughts and my thought processes. Let strongholds come down. In Jesus' name, let every argument be exposed. Everything that it exalts itself against the knowledge of God, every atheistic train of thought, every religious train of thought, let them be exposed and come down. In Jesus' name, I am being renewed in the spirit of my mind. I am being transformed by the renewing of my mind in Jesus' name. Let the leaven of the kingdom permeate my every thought in Jesus' name. Amen. There is a name without contention whose power can't be questioned or contained with humble faith he rules the earth and heavens his glory knows no measure or refrain and it's bursting past the border Jesus, you're the king and you're the center of it all. There is a name reaching past the margins, calling sons and daughters back to him. And as he We can hear the roar of heaven as prodigals are coming home again. Oh, the triumph of his name will never end. Jesus, enthroned upon the praises of our the king and you're the center of it all. For every eye will see, every heart will know, there is no name above the name of Jesus. Earth could not hold him down, no grave could keep him sin and sickness fell to the name of Jesus for every eye will see every heart will know there is no name above the name of Jesus death could not hold him down no grave could keep him bound all sin and sickness fell to the name 
teams, please come and be available. If you need prayer today for anything, healing, financial, relational, whatever, please feel free to come and get prayed for. The benediction I want to give you is Ephesians 3, 20 and 21. Now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power of that works in us to him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. God bless you, saints. Have a wonderful week.